Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, it's good to be back. I was out of town last weekend. I was preaching for some pastor friends, covering them as they were off and about. And, um, and I brought a message to that church that I felt um, was what they needed for their season. And, um, and I, I prepared it. It was specifically for them. But after preaching it, I realized that, you know what, I think this is beyond a message for a church. This is a message for the body of Christ right now, for every single one of us in this room. So today's message is not for, a, you know, a few or a bunch. It's for every single person that's sitting under the presence of God today. And I really believe that God is going to do something in every single one of us. And so uh, get ready. Let's all pray. Bow your head. Close your eyes for a second. You know why? Because you want to put your attention on God right now. And so, Father, we just come boldly before your throne of grace, and we want to be attentive to what you want to speak to us today. I ask you in the name of Jesus that you would allow us to have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's ready to receive what you want to speak to us and say to us this morning. I pray, Father, that today that you're going to bring answers, you're going to bring healing, you're going to bring restoration, you're going to bring, Father, your amazing presence, your person with your power, and you're going to elevate us to the next level. I thank you, Lord, that we came today with expectation. We came with expectation to not only hear from you, but to experience you, Father, in a new way. And we just say thank you for your love, thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, say amen. amen. Awesome. Well, um, when I was 11 years old, I was what they call an old soul. I grew up very fast in life. So at the age of eight, I was hanging out with 30-year-old men, 20-year-olds, just grew up too fast. And I remember being in Mexico, visiting my, my family for the first time. And, and um, you know, one of my family members, my uncles, they... They've, they've owned a trucking company for many years, and I happened to be with my cousin, and uh, he was driving an 18-wheeler. And, of course, at 11 years old, you know what, I wanted to experience life like, like never before. And I said to my cousin, I said, hey, what do you think if, I, if you give me permission to drive this, this trailer? He's like, you're crazy. You're 11 years old. You can't do that. I'm like, come on. So I knew enough to... to you know, motivate him, inspire him, and, and get him to tell me yes. And so, of course, him wanting to be the cool cousin, eventually, you know, he, I broke him. And he said, okay, fine. He says, but you got to listen to me. And I said, okay, what? And so he begins to describe, explain, and, and, and almost paint a picture of how driving a 18-wheeler trailer, that's manual, right, stick ship, what we call stick ship, how it works and how it functions, and he begins to just break it down in detail. I'm 11 years old. I ain't listening. You know, I just like the idea that I'm going to drive an 18-wheeler truck, and so he gets done, and he says, did you hear everything I said? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm in the truck now, and I start putting it on first. I could remember, you know, when he said, uh, you got to push in the clutch, and then you release a little bit of the clutch. At the same time, you give it a little bit of gas. And, and so I got it, you know, first gear, and we start moving. And it was awesome. I was like, oh, my God, I'm driving an 18-wheeler truck, and I'm 11 years old, and I'm in Mexico, and only in Mexico can you do this. And so I'm driving this thing, and it's moving, and it's moving, and it's moving. But how many know that, that when you drive a, a manual vehicle, the engine eventually revs? And you know what I mean by rev, right? And so you're driving a car, whether it's a trailer or a car, at some point when the engine starts revving, that rev noise is a sign that it's time to do what? So I'm, I'm just enjoying the ride. I'm like, and my kid's like, shift, 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 shift. And, and then, of course, he got me nervous. So I started doing this. And it's like, and you know how that goes. If you've ever driven a standard, you basically are grinding your transmission. And, and, and this, this, is, this was a really nice truck. So he's ticked off now. 
You know, he's like, you didn't listen. I told you that. And, of course, no, no one's listening. And, 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 uh, and, you know, when you think about a story like this, you could only think like, well, you know, shift happens, you know. <laughs> what does that mean? What do you mean by shift happens? Let me tell you something. I think so many of us live that way. Where you know there's a rev in your life. And, and you can hear it. You come on Sunday and you're hearing the rev, you're hearing the message, you're hearing the noise, you're hearing the wind of God, you're hearing the breath of God, but, but we don't shift. And God's trying to get us to shift into this new season. God's trying to, to get us to shift into this new dynamic place that God wants to bring you into. But like so many of us, we get so caught up only on listening. See, the Bible says this, let him who has ears let them hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And so what happens is we're all here present in the presence of God, and we all have ears, but not everyone's hearing. And God wants us to hear what he's speaking and saying to the body of Christ. God is saying, I am already doing a shift, and you have to be careful not to be left behind. Are you hearing me this morning? So... I know that sometimes in our life we, we, we get stuck, and, and, and I know that God wants to take us from a place of being stuck to a place of, of motion, and, and he wants to take us from, from being in a place of slumber, because I think sometimes some of us can be spiritually very slumber, you know, uh, just, just going with the, the motions or the emotions of life, and, and, and then this whole thing called walking with God doesn't really mean much anymore. So we go into a state of slumber. But God is saying, I want to shift you from slumber to energy, to focus. God is saying, I want to I take you from a, a shift of sickness to health. I want to take you from a shift of just getting by, just, just living to pay the bills. You're just trying to survive. You're just trying to find this month's rent or, or just trying to pay the bills and, and, and you can't even have a, a nice or even decent vacation because you're always just trying to get out of debt. And, and how many know that God wants to take us from that place of, of debt and surviving to thriving at some point in our life? I mean, God wants to bless. I mean, you can't say that God is a blessing, but you're not seeing any of it. You can't say that. I mean, you can't stand before God one day when you die and you tell God, why did you give me this poor, messed up, jacked up life where I couldn't even afford to be a blessing? I don't want to be blessed or even be that person that says, I want to make millions because I believe that there are people here that God wants to raise up to make all kinds of money, but it's not just for you. God wants to bless you for you to be a blessing. And so when you stand before God the Father and you start talking about all your struggles, you're literally going to be standing on streets of gold telling God how he couldn't afford to take care of you. How's that going to work for you? Are you hearing me today? And so God, God wants to shift us from this, this, this place, places in our life, from even from setbacks. Maybe the last 10 months you've been trying to do different things and, and, you, and you, you tried this and you tried that and it's been setback after setback. Maybe emotionally you, you, you're getting better but then you're not getting better and you just keep going back. But God wants to shift you from setback to come back. Come back. Some of us are disappointed. We're still disappointed with some of the setbacks we've had. In the last 10 months, we're in October now. But how many know that God wants to shift us? He wants to prepare us, not for 2019. God wants to prepare us for October of 2018. Some of us can't wait for the year to end. God's saying, what, are you dead? No, we, we can shift now. Now, God's saying, now is the time. But we have to begin to get in, in sync with God. Now, how, how do we shift? Two things must occur in order for God to shift you. Number one, are you ready? Obedience. The Bible says this, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I hate to do, those I keep doing. And so we got to come to a place where we have to obey the word of God. No longer, no longer can the body of Christ just sit and listen to messages that tickle your ears and nothing is changing on the inside of you. No longer is God just wanting you to sit in churches and, and, and allow you to feel inspired or motivated. God is saying, I want to transform your life. I want to shift your life into this new season. But it's going to take cooperation. And cooperation without obedience is dead. 
God needs us to obey his word. Obey. Number two. Number two, timing. Everybody say timing. When it's your season, you can't sit back. You just can't sit back like, okay, I know. Like right now, I preach this message and, and, and everyone's like, okay, wow, okay. Yeah, I can sense. I can feel the timing of God. Yeah. Okay, great. Now what are you going to do? What, what, what are you going to do in order to accept the timing of God? And when you're in the timing of God, you need to step into it. You need to step into it. What do I mean by that? I read a story about uh, a baby locust. And there are ugly little things. But, but baby locusts are also known as hoppers. Everybody say hoppers. And, um, and so what happens is they have these tiny little bodies. And along with those tiny little bodies, they can't fly yet, but they got these tiny little wings that are proportionate to its body. In other words, it was created to its proportion. However, the wonderful, beautiful thing about uh, locusts or baby locusts or hoppers is that they don't let their image, they don't let their, 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 their fashion or how, how they were created or made to limit what they can do. So what's interesting is that little baby locust hoppers can actually jump 200 times its height. How in the world can you do? Now, now, mind you, they don't know how to fly, but they don't just hop for any reason, okay? They're not like the little Mexican hopping beans, okay? <laughs> Hoppers or locusts, they understand they can't fly. They got wings, but can't fly. Just like many of you, you got potential, but untapped potential, there's no potential at all. God says, you're eagles, and you're the sword, but not every eagle is born flying. And so what the hopper does, it listens. Everybody say listens. It listens for the wind. And once it hears the wind, just... It, it, uh, this is true. I'm not making this up. Then after it listens for the wind, the, the, the hopper then begins to look up with its little eyes. And it looks up and it begins to wait to see for the trees to begin to wrestle. Have you ever heard, especially as we're coming into a new season, what season are we in now? Autumn. We're in autumn now. We're in a new season. And so, you know, all the leaves are falling. And just, it's just a beautiful thing, right? And I, I have a tree in my backyard that's really just, it's beautiful. And lately I've been hearing the winds. And when you hear the winds, I like going outside because I like to hear the sound of the leaves just going shh. And you hear and it sounds beautiful. I love it. Well, the locust just waits for the sound and the wrestling of the trees. And maybe right now there's some wrestling inside of you that's happening. And, and God's saying, okay, uh, that's happening because I'm speaking to you. And so once it hears the wind and once it sees the wrestling of the trees, it waits for the perfect blow of the wind. And then it begins to hop. You know why? Because it allows, he allows or she allows the wind or it allows the wind to propel that little jump higher. And it begins to develop strength in order for the wings to go from just looking like one to being an actual locust that can fly. And so this happens over. How, what is it about the locust? What's the instinct for it to know that, that, that it can't fly, but it also knows that that it needs to wait for the sound of wind, and, it's the, and he needs to see the, the wrestling. How is that? As I'm reading, I'm like, God, you're so profound. But God puts these little things in, on the earth to, to awaken us and to show us how great and awesome he is on how he thinks big beyond anything that we could ever imagine. And you know what happens? Is that I believe that when God created us, when God created like an insect called a locust, he created it with instincts inside for it to know what to do next. Well, I think that so many of us, we focus doing life, always focus on what's external, what's outside of us. We're always waiting, okay, when, 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 when God shows me that, that, that that's what I'm supposed to do, then that's what I'm going to follow. Or when, when God shows me a sign, and I get it, God does Signs, wonders, and miracles. But doesn't that suck if you live the rest of your life only looking for signs and you never find them? How sad would that be? You wake up 40 years later and nothing's changed. So you know what I'm trying to tell you? What I'm trying to tell you is you work so hard on the externals when God created you to be internal. 
we work so hard on everything outside of us. Come on, we tell God, God, show me and I'll believe. God says, no, believe me, then I'll show you. See, we have to come back to the instinct of the one who lives inside of us, and his name is Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the wind of God. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God. The Holy Spirit is the director. The Holy Spirit is the guider. The Holy Spirit is not only the director, the guider, but he's the comforter. The Holy Spirit is the interpreter of the voice and the wind of God. But too many in the church are just looking for the outward signs and God's saying hey listen we need to focus a little bit more on your internal self we, we gotta it starts in God needs to calm the storm inside before he can calm the storm outside because the storms outside will never stop but the storm inside can be controlled are you hearing me and so God's saying I'm shifting, I'm shifting you. Uh, can you hear? Can, can you hear the wind? Can, can you hear the message? Or today, are you just listening to another message? Or are you listening with the intention of saying, God, I'm ready for the shift in my life. Because there's dead ears in here and there's living ears in here. Both are in here. The question is, which one are you? Are you listening to shift or are you just listening to mark off the church attendance on Sunday. What are you doing here? Are you just coming to church because it makes your spouse happy, your kids happy? Or are you coming to the house because you're expecting God to speak to you a word in season? Because one word in season can change the rest of your life. One word. One thing I say today. You may not get the whole thing, but you'll hear one line, one thing, and you'll be like, oh, my God, I've awakened. You'll be like that little hopper. And you may say, you know what, I may not have it all together, but I know, listen, I, 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 may, I may not know, you know, what, 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 what voices I need to be listening to, but one thing I do know for sure is I know the voice of God. When he tells me it's time to shift, I shift. I must obey, and I must do number two, what? What's wrong with y'all? See what I mean? No one's listening. Please turn off your radio. Radio's on. Somebody's radio's on. Listen, timing. The hopper knows the timing. The hopper, the moment that wind blows, he hops. God speaks a word to us, we don't hop. We're like, okay, that's great. That's awesome. Oh, that is such a good word. Oh, my God. And that what we do in church? Oh, that, that, was so, that was so good, Pastor. I, that, that message is so for me. You see them a month later? talking about the same problems but that word was just for you you didn't hop you didn't hop where's the fruit of the hop we should be progressing not digressing it shouldn't be the same sad story every single year talking about the same old problem the same old challenges the same old lack Every year, the church, the body of Christ, the people of God should be prospering even as their soul prospers and be in health. That is God's will. God wants that for every single one of us. But we're going to have to begin to learn that, you know what, we have a big God and he lives on the inside of us. That's why the Bible says, and greater is he who lives than he that's in the world. When is that going to be a revelation? I got a giant inside of me. There's a giant inside of you. When will you hop like the giant that God called you to be? Amen? God says this, not by might, nor by your power, but by my spirit. God says, I'll do some crazy stuff in your life. I'm believing that right now is a shift of you coming back to believing again. Where you're going to believe God for big things again. You're going to believe God that he can. He is a God that he can and he will again. But that starts with you making sure that you trust him in this season right now. I'm ready for God's abundance. How about you? Okay, let me give you a definition of shift because some of us may have different definitions. A shift is something that happens when you are transitioning from one place in your life. And every single one of us are in a place in our life. But you're transitioning from one place in your life into God's plan for you because so many of us can mis misinterpret this and we're like okay God has shifted me from here and I and I feel like I need to be there 
okay, well, I, I'm not telling you to feel where you should be. I'm telling you to find out what is God's plan for this season now. Not, 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 not what's your plan. What's his plan? What's his plan for this situation right now? Because we keep messing things up. But God is saying, when I shift, I'm shifting you based on where I'm trying to take you. But that takes you having ears to hear what God is shifting you into. God is shifting this church into favor. That means that the favor of God is coming upon you right now. And you have to learn to accept it. Like, okay, you know what? Man, this week I'm going to be favored at work. Man, I'm going to get a raise this week, praise God. Like, when was the last time you just believed God for another raise? Oh, but it's not the season for raises, praise God. It, you know, it happens every January. That's why, that's why we don't shift. Because we've been conformed. We've been defined. But how many know that God cannot be... He cannot be conformed. He cannot be confined. And he still can't be defined. Because he's never ending. He's always doing something new. And so God is saying, hey, listen, I can do some pretty crazy, amazing things in your life if you would just accept the season I'm bringing you into. You don't have to wait for what the world says. You can go ahead and begin to believe what God can do right now in this moment. God can give you a raise at any moment he wants. And I know because I've experienced that. I've had bonuses prior to being in ministry when they weren't supposed to be giving bonuses. But when the favor of God is on you because of how you work, how you conduct yourself, man, I tell you, the favor just, ch the blessings chase you. You don't have to chase the blessing. They chase you down. Let me give you a verse because here's, here's, here's what I mean scripturally. Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 6 says this. And this is going to tie into what I shared in my story of driving. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. What day of the week? You know what the first day of the week is? Sunday. So don't be waiting for Monday. The woman took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered there, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, while they were wondering about this, and so many of us are still wondering about stuff. <laughs> while they were wondering about this, suddenly men in clothes... They gleamed like lightning, stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has what? He has what? It's, now look at this. And then the angel. Now mind you, these are angels talking to them. These weren't just men. They were angels. That God, God literally had to send a spokesperson from heaven to remind them. He says, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? See, here's the problem with us. My cousin told me, Mauricio, and he began to explain every single process of how you drive an 18-wheeler. He explained every, like if I really cared, he explained to me the history of it, how it works, how it functions, how it moves, and, and how it shakes sometimes. And, and let me tell you something. Jesus constantly told the disciples, and this is what's going to happen, man. They're going to take me from you. They're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me. They're going to put me on a cross. They're going to sacrifice me. They're going to they're gonna put stripes on me, but it's by my stripes that you're healed it's by my blood that you're forgiven then they're going to bury me and then they're going to put me in a tomb but on the third day I will rise again but guess what they didn't remember that they were just excited about the whole relationship of Jesus but they weren't excited that Jesus had more than just the cross death and a resurrection and so many of us we stay stuck and so what happens God has to send a spokesperson from heaven to tell them, forget tell them, to ask them a question. He said to them what? Put the verse back up. He says, um, uh, why do you look for the living among the dead? What does that mean? In other words, he was saying through those angels, like, okay, um, y'all may have forgot. <laughs> uh, when Jesus was with you, he kept telling you about a shift that was going to happen in your life. And so the angel's question is like, so why would you look for the living shift in a place called dead or a place called tomb? And so these women could not remember. 
And so the angel of God is reminding them of every single word. I bet they had a class right there at that moment where they were literally reminding them. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, I remember that. I rem- oh, I remember when he said that. Oh, oh, yeah, I remember. And then they finally got the light bulb went on. And they went back to the disciples. Then, you know, the men came. And they were also freaking like, oh, my God, it's empty. Same thing. They had to tell them what they were reminded of. And so many of us, we can stay so stuck, never shifting into that new place because we keep going back to the tomb of disappointment. And you're trying to come into this shift of of newness of life, but we keep going back to the old testimony. We keep going back to that old tomb, that dead place. Some of us, we still have the tomb of divorce. And yes, you mourned, and it hurt, but you're still mourning. You're still hurting. Maybe some of you are in the tomb of that sickness, that disease that took years from your life, and you're still thinking about, if only I had those years back. Well, guess what? God is saying, no matter what place, what season you're in in your life, you need to stop going to the tomb, and you need to start finding life in the living. Amen? Amen. That's what God is doing in us. And not not everyone's going to get this, and that's okay. Not everyone is going to get this, but there comes a season where you have to allow the word of God to begin to give you a fresh revelation of what he wants to do in your life. Amen? Amen. Come on, everybody say God's moved on. on. That's what the angels are saying. Like, hey, man, he's already, this is old news. The cross, the burial, the, like, why are we still talking about that? Aren't you glad that God just doesn't stay stuck in the last miracle he did in your life? Like, God's like, come on, man, can we do some more in your life? I mean, I I promise you, the moment the disciples and everybody finally remembered every single word that Jesus said, just like so many of us, we read the Bible, but we forget every single word that Jesus spoke of us. But once you get it, you're just like, dang, why why was I even going there? Do you think that any of the disciples ever went back after that to go check out the tomb again? If you go to Israel today and you go to the tomb, outside the tomb it says, the tomb is empty. So literally people fly across the world to go to Israel, which is awesome, I love it. Only to go see an empty tomb. And that's what God is saying to the church. He's saying, hey, listen, let's stop going back to the old victories. Let's stop going back to the old tombs. And let's start creating some new things. Let's just move on. It's kind of like the children of Israel. Okay, Moses got them out of Egypt. Fine. They went into the desert. They were there for a long time. The problem they have is that they pitched a tent to live there, to stay there. So many of us have pitched a tent of, of, of resentment, of unforgiveness. And, and you know what happened with Moses? Man, they got him so angry that instead of, you know, obeying God, he hit the rock. And then God said, okay, Moses, you're done. And so we know that 1.3 or 1.4 million Israelites died in the desert because they weren't ready to shift. But then God raised up another man by the name of Joshua. And he told Joshua, tell my people that Moses, my servant, is dead. Think about it. Isn't that what he said in the word? He says, tell them that my servant, my servant, Moses, he's dead. But I am ready to cross over to the other side of the Jordan with Joshua. We have to come back to that place that maybe you keep finding life in dead places. My servant, Moses, is dead. It is moving. We're changing. We're going to shift some things. And then we know that, obviously, they made it to the other side. They got their blessing. You have to come to the place that maybe the places I've been looking for my victory, I keep looking in an empty tomb. I'm never going to find change there. Nothing's changing. Nothing's shifting. I love this. Say it with me, shift happens. I'm going to say this because this I think the church needs to hear. You may be going back to the tomb of unanswered prayer. And I see this with a lot of Christians. I see a lot of bitter Christians. Let me, let me just explain this without offending anybody. Sometimes we can be holding on to a prayer that we prayed for. Nothing wrong with that. We should be praying. But I want you to know something. God will never be undermined by man's personal will prayer. Okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me give you scripture for that. So Jesus is in, the, is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's suffering, and he's in pain. And he tells God, he prays to God in a garden. He says, God, can you please, can you just let this cup pass me by? In other words, can you let all I'm about to experience, can you just kind of, can we just like skip that part, and let's just go ahead and just save the world? But then he understands. See, Jesus, he prayed 
at that moment his own personal will. But then he says this in his prayer, but not my will, but what? Your will be done. And it's not that Jesus, you know, had, had this moment where he was ready to abandon what he was going to do. No, he knew that. He just, but remember, he came in the form, form of flesh so that he can experience everything that you and I would experience. He already knew that we would have, like, wimp out prayers like that. Like, can you just get me out of this situation? God's like, no, <laughs> it's all part of the process. And, and, but Jesus understood. He's like, we, me and the Father were one. And so he says, not, not my will, but your will be done. And so what I'm saying is this, is that sometimes we pray prayers that we have made personal wills and not his will. And so our job is to pray his will. If not, you can stay in that same prayer for so many years called unanswered prayer and never go back to your prayer closet and say, I wonder if what I prayed for was ever even his will to begin with. I wonder if my prayer was just manipulating him to do what I want him to do instead of just asking him, Father, what is your will about this situation? Oh, I know, because I, there's a lot of angry Christians. That I've been waiting for five years. Ten, I've been, hey, listen, I've been waiting for 12 years to get my lungs healed. 12 years. Yesterday I had an episode. My lungs shut. And, and I had someone ask me, how do you do it? I'm like, you know what? I have learned to just pray his will. Like, Father, if, if your will is for me to struggle like this, as long as you give me breath, praise the Lord. Just let me get up every day. And you know what? Why? Because God doesn't want me to be consumed on my unanswered prayer. God wants me to be consumed with the one who gives me breath in this life. Amen? Amen? We get so consumed with what hasn't happened instead of being so consumed with what could happen with him. Let, let me explain it to you. Look, look, look at this quickly, quickly. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, quickly. Or 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 through 10. Look, it says, that is what the scripture, scriptures mean when they say, look at this. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his what? For his spirit searches out everything internally and shows us God's deep secrets. So, so stay with me. So God is ready to, to show us some. In other words, in this shift, God's saying, doors that have been shut, I can open them. You know, healings that have not manifested, God's saying, I can do them supernaturally. For example, uh, I, I remember watching, a, I think it was a video, um, this is years ago, of this couple, Christian couple, who were sharing their story of not being able to uh, make babies. And so they did this whole thing called in vitro. And so they did the in vitro over and over and over again until finally it worked. And now they're pregnant, not with one, but with six. <laughs> that, can somebody say full quiver? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right? And so they're blessed. So, so they're excited. So think about it. You know, they couldn't have babies, but, but God, God always finds, you know, he, God can do a miracle any way he wants. And, and so, boom, she's, she's got six, and they give birth. They're excited. And now they have all these babies. They go home. And then a letter in the mail comes in. Of course, anytime God does something awesome for you, the enemy always tries to squeeze in to get you to shift back. And you know what the letter said? It said, unfortunately, your health insurance did not cover the birthing of your children. And the bill was $2 million for all the things they had to do for the children in the time they were in the hospital. You're talking about six. So, you know, when they're six, they're, they're tiny. They probably weigh like three pounds, two pounds. And so they had, this bill is too. Now, here's what's awesome. For some of us, man, we'd be like, man, what in the, and, you know, we just, you know, we, it goes from, you know, shift happens to the other word, right? <laughs> and y'all start going crazy. But these people were just so like, you know what, that's okay. They were more consumed with the blessing than being consumed with a $2 million bill. And so they, they said to each other, it's okay. That's right. If we have to pay this for the rest of our life, we're going to pay for it. That's, that's like, dang, who are you? Are you Jesus? <laughs> right? Like, we're supposed to be right. And so, so they're like, okay, well, we're going to 
We're going to have to pay, but we have, our, we have our blessings. Six kids. Months go by. December comes. And on December, they didn't say what day, but they said it was, it was like a Christmas gift to them. They said they, they got a call from the board. And this, this was a, a main head of the board of the hospital. And he said, you know what, we, we, we took it upon ourselves to review because once we heard about a $2 million uh, bill for, for having six kids, we, we just thought to ourselves, how is this possible? How is this family going to do it? And they said, the guy said this, and, and we have never, ever done this. We, we, we all voted and we decided to forgive the $2 million from you. No eye has seen. No ear has heard. And no mind has imagined what God can do in this season. But we get so conformed with where we're at. And then you just say, that's my lot in life. When God say, no, you haven't seen nothing yet. You haven't heard nothing yet. You, had, you haven't even imagined. See, so many of us, we have these dreams. And God looks at them and like, dang, they look like locusts. God's saying, I have more. God has moved on from whatever season you've been in. And God is saying, I am shifting you into a new season of hope. David said this. He said, I pitch my tent in the land of hope. But so many of us have pitched our tent in the land of self-pity. And you just keep thinking about what hasn't happened, what didn't happen. And God's saying, have you not heard? Have you not seen? <laughs> have you not imagined what I can do? God is a God of the impossible. He can take the most impossible situation right now and he can turn that around. But we're going to have to shift the way we think. Because right now, many of us, we hear a message like this and you're either going to allow a shift or you're going to deny a shift. It's totally up to you on how you're going to handle this. Let me give you this point on belief real quickly. Um, the only power a lie has is your belief. Say that with me. The only power a lie has is your belief. That, that's the, in other words, right now, some of us, we're just so stuck on the lie that I, I can never afford that. I could never own a house. I, I, I could never own my own company. I, I, I could never see myself managing anything. And that's a lie. See, the only power that lie has is what you, what you choose to believe. And you're either going to choose to believe that God is shifting some things right now in your life or you're going to deny that God is speaking to the church, that the wind and the voice of God is coming and he's awakening the church again to say, come on, let's start believing because my, your internal man, the Holy Spirit, wants to take you somewhere. Look at John 5 verses 1 through 15 to make or, or strengthen that point. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these late, a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, and they were all just what? Waiting, just waiting. What are you doing? Just waiting, just waiting on God. Just waiting. Just waiting. Oh, just, just waiting? Yeah, just, we're just waiting. They were waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, and stirred up the water. And I mind you, if you understand the history of this context, the angel would only come once a year. It was like lottery. Once a year. And when that angel would come into that, that area the, where the pools were, if that angel stirred, man, you better, you better hope and pray you made it in there. And it was just supernatural miracles. And so that's awesome. I love what, that God did stuff like that. But now there's, there's Jesus. He's walking. This says, for the angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity for how many years? 38. How many years? 38. 38 years. So let's just pretend that, that, that this man with a 38 infirmity was right here with us in 2018. That means Jesus shows up like he did right now at Elevate Church and he sees some people that have been in a condition for however many years. What's... 2018 minus 38. Okay, so the person had an issue since 1980. Just think that way. Just think that way for a little bit. Maybe you've had an issue since, I don't know, 2005. Maybe 2010. 
Maybe you've had an issue since 2015. And God sees you and he's looking at you today. And look what he says. And when Jesus saw him or saw her lying there and knew that he or she already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Notice, what did the first angels do with Mary and Martha when they were at the empty tomb? He just made, he had a conversation. He asked them a question. Why are you looking for the living and the dead? Now Jesus, fast forward. Now he shows up. He says, do you want to be made well? It was a question. Question. Some of you, so many of us are looking for answers, but God will bring it back to you and ask you a question. Do you want to be made well? No, God, that's not what I asked you. Look, look, look. I'm telling you this because some of us will hopefully get set free today. Some of you got this. Some of you didn't. That's okay. You're growing up. It's okay. The wind will come back again. Don't worry. Next Sunday. Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another man steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And then the haters therefore came up. And they said to him, who was cured? They said, man, it's Saturday. What is wrong with you? It's not lawful for you to be carrying a bed on Saturday. We know that you've been paralyzed, but what do you do? They got so consumed with the law instead of being consumed with the healing and the breakthrough. You can be so consumed with your trauma, your drama, your, your circumstance, and not realize that God can do a miracle on a Sabbath when you're not supposed to be doing nothing. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered him. He said, hey, listen, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. So I just went ahead and took up my bed and walked. Then they asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him at Elevate Church. And he said to him, see, come on, man, you see, you have been made well. How does this reflect us today? Beyond a story of a man being paralyzed, I believe that the greater revelation is that he was confronting a thought. So many of us cannot shift, not because you can't rise up and walk, but because mentally, internally, we, 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 we don't know how to shift when God is saying, do you want to be made well? So what, what does he do? What do we do? We do what we know best. We start talking about all the problems. What's not happening? And so here's, here's the problem. So this man who is paralyzed for 38 years, 38 years. Jesus said, okay, there will be no more stirring of the water. I'm here to stir you up, man. Do you want to be made well? The problem with that man was this. He was waiting for an angel. In other words, like so many of us, we're waiting for a sign from God so that we can shift. Okay, God, bring an angel. And we're looking. Where's the angel? Where's this? Okay, if there's a tortilla that's the shape of Jesus, then I'll believe. <laughs> oh, look at the sky. Look, it's the Lord looking at you. It's a sign. We, we, if we're not careful, you're just waiting for a miracle. And I love miracles, guys. I believe in miracles. But miracles are only given when you've exhausted every possible thing in your own strength. Because God has given you the capacity to fly 200 times beyond what you can do. And, and, and so where's the angel? Where, the, where be the angel? I'm waiting for an angel. Are you waiting for the angel? You know what he was waiting for next? Not only was he waiting for an angel, he was waiting for a stirring of the water. He was looking for a move of God. I can't wait to go to that, that, that prophetic conference, man. Something's going to move me there, man. Yeah, yeah, okay, go, go, go to your moving. I love those. I, we believe in them. Go to Ignite. There's a moving of the Spirit. Yay. But, but we can be so conditioned to just keep waiting for an angel, be conditioned waiting for a prophetic word, a prophetic move. And the last thing, you know what he was waiting for? He was waiting for a man to carry him and throw him in the pool. And so many of us won't shift if you're waiting for an angel, if you're waiting for a move of, a, of, of, of God or move of the water. 
or if you're waiting for a man. Some of us are waiting for people to come back and say, I was wrong. It was my fault. I'm so sorry. You may wait for 38 years for that one. God is saying, he looked at me and said, I'm Jesus. I'm all you need. Take up your bed and walk. And we're waiting. I'm waiting for my healing. I'm waiting. Jesus said, and by my stripes, you were made healed. I'm just waiting for an answer. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. I, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a word. I'm wait- You're going to be waiting for a long time. And the only response Jesus has for us is take up your bed. Or get up, take up your bed, and walk. He was shifting his idea. Notice he put it all back on him. What was he doing? He was putting it on an angel. He was putting it on a moving of the water. And he was putting it on a man. And Jesus said, no, I want you to get up. I want you to take your bed. And I want you to walk. I've never done that before. But okay, let's do it. And he just went. That's a shift. That's a shift. Are you ready for a shift? Stand to your feet. Let's, let's stand up. Let me, let me just pray for us real quick. <laughs> Does this make sense to you or no? Okay, I, I hope this, 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 this speaks to you. This one's hot off the press. So just, just stay in the next few weeks. See, because your life, your life right now is going to take you in the direction you think. And if you just keep thinking about the angel, if you just keep thinking about the moving of the water, if you just keep thinking about the people that are supposed to help you to get to your place, which are all wonderful things. I believe in the, in the move of God. I believe in the angels of God. I've seen them in this church. I believe in, in men and women of God that can help. But let me tell you something. At the end of everything, you're only going to stand in the presence of one, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus is going to say, I told you, get up. I told you, pick up your bed. And I told you to walk. And the only reason you stayed there is not because I couldn't. It's because you just wouldn't. You wouldn't shift. And you failed to realize that shift happens in life. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.